Reptiles are amazing, but what if you want one that doesn't eat insects or rodents or anything living at all? Today, let's go over the top five fully herbivore reptiles that only eat plants. My name's Adam, this is Diamond, you're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, stick around. For this video, I'm going to include some reptiles that might eat a little bit of protein, but their natural diet and what they need to thrive, not just survive, but thrive and live a perfectly healthy life is just plants. So these are herbivores, or I'll probably use vegan in the title because clickety click click. So let's just get going on it. And I think that the one that we're gonna start out with is one of the coolest reptiles and super underrated. Number five, monkey tail skinks, or sometimes called Solomon Island skinks or Solomon Island prehensile tail skinks. Anyway, this is the biggest skink in the world. Now, when I say biggest, I mean they get like 30-ish, sometimes 32 inches, so not that much bigger than a bearded dragon. Well, I mean, I guess it's kind of bigger than a bearded dragon, but I've got an Indonesian blue tongue skink that's about 30 inches. So as far as skinks go, big. The difference between my big boy Irwin here and Solomon Island skinks or monkey tail skinks, we'll call them because I think that's the coolest name is, well, monkey tail skinks will be up in the trees and also the diet, of course, too, right? Because I think most skinks are unreal. They're rad, but something that only eats plants is amazing. Now, off the bat, at the beginning of the video, I'll tell you why most people do this, why most people want something or some people want something that doesn't eat insects or rodents. Well, you don't need to freeze rodents in your freezer, that's one thing, or buy rodents, or have the smell of rodents in your house, or have insects in your house, or have, like, I mean, you. no matter how careful you are, I've got a cricket that chirps in the bedroom across the hall, and like, I feel like I live in a jungle sometimes. So it's just easier for some of us to go to the grocery store or make a garden or whatever. Anyway, Solomon Island monkey tail skinks are amazing. They are kind of expensive, so that's why they're kind of high up on the list. And also their claws are really strong and they can become handleable for sure, but they're not known as the most handleable skink. So I think they're amazing pets, but just not amazing enough for number one. Now, like I mentioned, they are going to be arboreal, semi-arboreal, however most people classify them. So you're gonna need something that's not only big, like long-wise, but also a little bit taller than you would with something like a blue tongue skink or something like a Schneider skink, whatever. A bigger skink means a bigger enclosure. Now their diet is unreal. They're gonna eat things like leafy greens. They can also eat things like cooked sweet potato, which I think is awesome. But in the wild, they will sometimes eat a little bit of protein just like bugs that are on the leaves that they're eating, but that's not something they need. So I wanna make sure, and I talked to somebody who breeds these and they did clarify. They might eat some protein. It's not bad if they do, but all you should be feeding them or all you need to feed them are vegetables and plant matter. So it fits a list and monkey tail skinks are freaking wicked, like so cool. Number four, Euromastix. Euromastix have a special place in my heart. I remember the first time I ever saw them and found out what they were, I was buying Cheech, the first leopard gecko I ever bought. I was at this store, Big Al's in Hamilton, Ontario, and they had a giant enclosure, 300 gallon with a bunch of these things in there. I'm like, what the heck is that? These are so cool. They come from Northern Africa and parts of the Middle East. There's a bunch of different subspecies, by the way. So if you want something smaller, I have a Sahara type Euromastix, a heron Euromastix, or if you want something bigger, like an Egyptian. And the color difference is there too. Saharans are gonna be yellows and reds and things like that, where an Egyptian is gonna be a much darker drabber color, but also much bigger. And then there's things like ornates and like just all in all, Euromastix are so underrated. And I think they're great pets. They're kind of similar to bearded dragons a little bit, but they're more terrestrial. They're gonna eat seeds in their diet instead of, so bearded dragons, just if you're not aware, eat things like vegetables and they eat things like insects. These guys, Euromastix, will eat vegetables, just like a bearded dragon, but instead of insects, they eat things like seeds, which is uncommon. Most reptiles, even herbivores, don't eat seeds, but these guys do. So I feed my guy lentils. This is something that's a staple in his diet. I feed him lentils, I feed things like arugula, Swiss chard, dandelion green, watercress, things like that, and I'll also put a little bit of bee pollen on it 
that's like his favorite thing. As soon as you put the bee pollen on there, well, first of all, I start sneezing. And second of all, he runs across as fast as possible to go eat it. All in all, there's Euromastix for basically everybody as long as you're cool with a very dry species that needs a very hot basking spot. There's different colors, different sizes, and I, basically there's Euromastix for you, probably. Number three, most tortoises. Now I do put the disclaimer, most tortoises, because, well, the tortoises I keep don't fit. They are mostly herbivores, these red foots, which are actually cherry heads, but cherry heads, red foots, and yellow foots are all so similar I can lump them together. But they do need about 10% of their diet as protein. In the wild, they're gonna eat things like carrion, like dead stuff, right? They've even been, red foots have actually been seen eating dead monkeys, which maybe is a little bit gruesome, but it's kind of cool also. But I think what's really cool is most species, excluding these ones, eat just vegetables, basically. So if you want a sulcata, if you want something super big, they're the third biggest tortoise species in the world, and you have, you know, an acreage, you have a bunch of space, this would be great. Or if you want something a little bit smaller, maybe a Russian tortoise, then you're not gonna have to worry about feeding it insects or things like that. You can feed it prepared diet, like Missouri tortoise diet, or you can feed it just plants, vegetables, and a natural diet, or natural, I guess. So it's really up to you, but you don't have to buy insects or, you know, like rodents, stuff like that. Now tortoises, I wouldn't recommend for most beginners just because they need a lot of space. You need like that UVB, you need a whole bunch of things. And the space is like the big thing. In my opinion, I think you should be keeping tortoises outside if you can in your area for the time that it's available, the sunshine and the temperature is available to do so. Like I do. I think this is the first time I've ever shown this. This is my outside pen, which is big and Lumber's expensive, but it was worth it. It's 100% worth it. I built this thing in June or the end of May, and they've been outside since then. And because they can tolerate temperatures rather cool, these red foots, I haven't taken them in at all. We've had temperatures as low as, what was it that one day, like 14 degrees Celsius for a couple of hours, and they were fine. They've been outside in the rainstorms, they like it super humid, by the way, which is perfect for where I live, and they like it super hot, which it's been for most of the time, and they can handle the night drops. So, in my opinion, keeping tortoises outside is the bee's knees. I absolutely love it, and depending on where you are, maybe you want something like a red foot if you live in, say, Florida, somewhere where it's really humid, or if you live in Arizona and you have a lot of space, maybe a sulcata is best for you. So, I just think it works. No matter where you are, there's a tortoise for you, as long as you have room inside, because if you live in a place where it gets cold, like I do, you need to bring them inside. So, yeah, tortoises are pretty dope. And most of them eat just plants. Number two, something super underrated, chuckwallas. Chuckwallas are, I think I've only ever seen them in one reptile shop ever. That doesn't even exist anymore. I walked in there and I think he was cohabbing them with a bearded dragon, which I don't recommend. I'm like, what the heck is that thing? It had like a red back and kind of like a darker body. There's a bunch of different subspecies of chuckwallas. All of them come from Mexico and the Southern US. I think it's like Western Southern US. Similar size to a bearded dragon, a little bit smaller, kind of like 20-ish inches, somewhere around there and they're gonna be just herbivores. I mean, I wouldn't talk about them if they weren't, they kind of fit the list. These guys are gonna eat things like leafy greens, they're gonna eat flowers, they're gonna eat, they're all sorts of stuff, right? This isn't a care guide, but as a general rule, plant matter is what these guys are going to eat. They can become handleable, which I love. And Chuck Wallace, I think you're gonna see a resurgence in them. I think they were much more popular early 2000s, even 90s from the old guys, not old guys, but guys have been doing it forever who I talk to. And I've even seen them at expos and they're really cheap because most people don't know what they are. And if you get them from a baby or a young age, you can socialize them and they're gonna be kind of handleable or quite handleable. Maybe not like a bearded dragon where he's just gonna sit here and kind of eye my ear up and try to bite it, but I mean, they're gonna be pretty good for handling. A couple things to mention, they are a very hot desert loving species, right? Bearded dragons kind of have a similar type of basking temperature. So if you have something like that, similar care in terms of their humidity and their temperature and things like that. And uh, yeah, just change that UVB all the time. So they don't die terrible deaths. And that's it. Chuck wallows are pretty awesome. Okay, number one, reptile that can eat just vegetables, completely herbivore, rock iguanas and rhino iguanas. So basically everything kind of in that family. I cannot wait to actually own one of these things eventually. I actually have to move countries in order to do that because in Canada, there really aren't any available and you can't import them anymore. 
All of these uh, in the species or the family rather are coming from places like, you know, Cuba and Bahamas, like that type of area of the world. And I think that no matter what you get, right? A Cuban rock iguana is dope. A rhino iguana has like the rhino-y thing on its nose and kind of projections on its head. And they're the largest of the Cyclura species or family rather. So I think that they're amazing. And when I say big, by the way, I mean four-ish, sometimes up to five feet. They can be a little bit smaller, but they do top out pretty large. So you'll need to keep them in really big enclosures or keep them outside, which is what most people, like think Camp Cannon, for example, right? These are, in my opinion, the best large lizard to keep. Now, large lizards aren't for everybody, just like why I wouldn't recommend a tegu for everybody. They're big. And most of them are super placid though. And that's why I put them on the list. I think as long as you get them from a baby, you're not getting like an adult that you caught from the wild, you can socialize them to the point where they're just kind of like puppy dogs. And I think that is the allure of them is they're amazing, they're herbivores, they're very gentle for the most part. I don't think that you should just go and get one uh, on a whim. You should definitely do your research, make sure you have the outfitting necessary. I just think they're amazing. And some people cohabitate them with tortoises too, which is pretty dope. If I have the space, which I'm hoping to eventually and live in a country where you're allowed to keep them, I'll definitely have these. This is the holy grail reptile for me. I, I want one so bad. Like this is the reptile that I've been oogling over since I was like a kid. So these guys are amazing. They're your number one. What do you think? I got this idea from the comment section below. Do you think I did the list justice? Should there have been something else on there? Notice no green iguanas, by the way. Terrible pets, but also are herbivores. Terrible for most people anyway. Regardless, I wanna say thank you guys for taking your time and watching this video. It means the world. And hitting like, subscribe, cost you nothing, helps this channel immensely. And a special thank you to the Patreon supporters. You guys are freaking awesome. You guys get videos early, extra videos, you get discounts on the merch, you know about special projects, you've seen the now completed reptile room. For as little as $1 a month, you can be a Patreon supporter too. I'd really appreciate it. And Diamond's been whispering in my ear the entire time that he'll post like cool pictures in his hat for Patreon this week. So yeah, that's it. I think that's it. Because they do videos twice a week, that means that I'll see you on Thursday.